Hello everyone. We want to focus on designing detention basins for today, which is one of the most popular uh, measures for stormwater control and management. Uh, this is called among the best management practices, BMPs. And for today, we want to have some discussions about uh, the general guidelines and the technical steps to uh, do the designs and uh, come up with the details for basically constructing a detention basin. Um, they are also called extended detention basins because of their capacity uh, to hold stormwater for an extended period of time and they can be a uh, large infrastructure embedded in uh, urban landscaping like parks uh, with some intermittent uh, water storages for aquatic life in the new concepts of green infrastructure. But the traditional uh, detention basins, uh, they, we just know them as a popular BMP, best managing practices. Of course, it's a structural best management practice, not like education outreach, uh, which are uh, non-structural, but the traditional detention basins um, that which could be just uh, made of concrete or uh, compacted soil materials, they are not typically considered a GI unless there are some specific considerations for them to promote uh, infiltration and aquifer recharge or promoting uh, aquatic habitats and ecosystems and green engineering embedded in it. Um, they are basically applicable anywhere. The only concern would be uh, in like super uh, dense urbanized areas like downtown areas. Uh, there is not much space to allocate for EDDs and it's very expensive. Uh, for detention basins, we have two goals. Uh, of course, the flood control management aspects and the water quality part, which, as you know, is one of the most uh, highlights in this uh, course, one of the emphasis. Uh, with detention basins, we can provide a volume, which we know as water quality capture volume, WQCV. And the purpose of that is to capture the first flush pollution. We know that the, in, during the first four to six hours of storm, we have the urban pollution being washed off. And that portion can be captured uh, in detention basins. And for that, we, need, we actually have a specific storage, the WQCV storage, which is very, very efficient uh, for settling pollutants like suspended solids, as we go over it in a few minutes. Of course, we want to know our standards and our general guidelines. The City of San Diego Stormwater Standards Appendix E. Um, I encourage you to go over the uh, detention basin fact sheet E24. This is the one that they're showing in Chula Vista. And uh, as you can see, this has a massive space and some vegetation in it. So that's kind of a greener approach of having detention basin in um, some, uh, you know, embedded in some landscaping and some uh, green engineering with it. But again, that's not a necessary part of a detention basin. And uh, some general guidelines we don't want to make it too deep because of safety reasons. Uh, so if we can accommodate the storm volume in six feet or less than that, that is preferred. And uh, other uh, consideration is that we need to uh, discharge and release the water that is captured. And guidelines uh, require us to release the water between 24 to 96 hours. And uh, you'll see a lot of design guidelines for 40 hours as a typical ballpark. But anything between 24 to 96 hours is fine for 
uh, per regulations. And the side slope, the side slope, uh, we, we basically we consider a side slope of four to one because we want to uh, make sure that the soil is stable under saturated condition unless we are using concrete materials to uh, make it stabilized. Uh, just showing you uh, a typical plan profile, uh, a larger area with some inlet and of course some riprap for um, avoiding the erosion caused by frequent events. And there is a structure called riser, which uh, includes uh, some orifices and a weir uh, to release the water for different events. And the side view, you can see how um, it is uh, designed. Basically, this deeper area is a storage for frequent events, and then there is a larger area for extreme events. But this is a general uh, schematic, not a technical one. And we get to the details of design in a few minutes. And the process of pollutant removal in detention basin is through the settling. So that's why it is very efficient for suspended pollutants. Uh, you can see how it works for other type of pollutants. TSS is very good, but it, you know it's slightly lower than for other pollutants like phosphorus and nitrogen. And another uh, benefit of using detection basin is that it reduces the downstream erosive forces because we can control the uh, release of captured water from the basin. And for today, uh, for designing purpose, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, um, bas basically the most simplified uh, schematic of it, which is prismatic. Um, you can see the two storages that I talked about earlier, the water quality capture volume uh, and the two-year event, we know these as frequent uh, situation. So we I'll consider this like a minor storage. And do you, do you see also on the bottom figure, uh, a prism, uh, which is smaller for minor storage and 10 year and 100 year for the major storage. And th again, there is no necessity to have this in a prismatic form. Uh, you can have any shapes for the basin as long as you can come up with a function for area to volume of the uh, basin. So you want to know at each depth what's the surface area and what's the volume of the basin. So the reason that I'm focusing on prismatic because uh, with just hand calculations you can come up with that. Uh, if you're working with, you know, irregular shapes, then that's the situation that you would need to work with advanced software like Civil 3D MicroStation to come up with those equations. And that's outside of the scope of this work and this uh, lecture. Uh, if you are uh, focusing on uh, land development for your future career, I definitely encourage you to learn how to work with uh, Civil 3D and software like that. So you're not only limited to prismatic shapes for your basin for stormwater control. Uh, Two-stage design, as I talked, uh, makes it very easy for inspection and maintenance. You know that you have a, you have a dedicated storage for minor events. Uh, so you expect this part be underwater uh, frequently, but then the larger area uh, that is only underwater in extreme events, so like at least every 10 years, like once in a 10 year, uh, that, or, you know, for events bigger than that. So this is how to, uh, you know, consider different maintenance and uh, technical design for the actual storages. And you'll see I have four uh, hydraulic elements here. Uh, my orifice number one, is in charge of releasing the WQCV 
uh, or if it's one and two together, control the release of two-year event, one, two, three, control the release of 10-year event, and the one, two, three orifice and the weir on top uh, is in charge of releasing the 100-year event. And that's kind of like working as an emergency uh, weir and spillway, basically, because if in case that you get events larger than that, they also can overtop. Um, another thing is that uh, the down time uh, we consider 24 to 96 hours and uh, this entire volume we designed it such a way for um, sizing the orifices so we can um, release the entire wa water uh, at 96 hours the most but there are typical design for 40 hours or in some cases 72 hours are, is typical down time. Uh, just to show you how a riser look, an orifice, and then you also have the veer on top, and of course this structure for, uh, you know, avoiding a trash like this, debris and trash going to the uh, system. Uh, so the WQCV, which is a general term water quality control volume, in San Diego region, uh, it's called DCV, design capture volume, basically the same thing. A very easy concept to implement. Uh, basically, you are dealing with uh, the C factor, runoff factor, which for, for that you can use the uh, rational method C. Uh, we discussed how to work with rational method through the San Diego County Hydrology Manual, or you can use this manual, section B11, to come up uh, with your C factor. And the parameter, next parameter is the depth of a 85th percentile 24 hour storm event. Uh, basically, the, the target is that we want to make sure for uh, if, if we range all, all the events uh, and sort them, uh, the one that stands at 85th percentile location and below. Uh, we are capturing the volume for that. So our detention basin has enough capacity to capture events as at, at this size or lower, lower than that. And for that, there is a map for entire San Diego County, and I'll show you in the next slide. But the next parameter in this equation is A, area of the uh, watershed. Uh, basically, you are uh, you know, the concept is similar to rational method. This is just a volume uh, for, this is the depth of a rainfall in, multiplied by the area, it makes it a volume of water. And we, we want to apply the uh, runoff factor to see uh, what part of it becomes uh, rain, becomes runoff. And uh, of course you're dealing with a conversion factor here, uh, but the concept is that uh, you want to target a specific rainfall and uh, make sure that you have enough capacity in your system to capture that. Um, so for depth of 85th percentile, uh, it's provided through the San Diego, um, City of San Diego stormwater standards. And uh, you can find the area of interest in the map and then read the numbers through the isopluvial map. For example, for areas near the SDSU campus, we're talking about like 0.55 inches of rainfall depth. So here, uh, now that we're focusing on prismatic basins, um, we have some general guidelines. Uh, for most of them, there is a threshold and you can decide what you want to do. Um, so in this figure, this is my plan view. And now I am focusing on the minor basin dimensions, the one that can capture WQCV and two-year events. 
uh, three general guidelines link like this L1. Uh, the link, if I'm talking about the bottom um, surface area, uh, we design it such that L1 is uh, twice L3 or it could be three times larger than that. that. These are, you know, general assumptions just to be able to start from somewhere and then solve for the final parameter here. Uh, typical design L1 to L3 is two to one or three to one. Then you also have a side slope for the side walls. And that's the one that we use four to one. That's for the stability considerations for the soil under saturated conditions. You can have uh, slopes that are more flat, like five to one, that's a lower slope, a five horizontal to one vertical. And the, you, there is a maximum depth that uh, it's typically considered for the minor basin. It's two feet, 1.5 is typical. So with, with these guidelines, then we are left with a remaining parameter like this, this um, L2, for example, uh, or we, you know, we can relate that again with to L3 because we know that L1 to L3 uh, has a ratio of two to one similar for L2 to L4. Uh, we start with these guidelines so we can end up with solving with one of them. And that's how we do it. Like L1 is equal to and two twice L3. Then we're using the typical uh, trapezoidal equation to relate uh, L1 and L2. And that's, uh, you know, this is L1, this is L2. Of course, L2 has one L1 in it and then uh, two of this limb. Each of them, uh, if this is H1 for the depth, then this is four times H1. So four times H1 on this side and four times H1 on this side. So I end up with eight times of H1 or I'm using, um, instead of L1, I'm using two L3 here. And uh, for L4 and L3, L4 and L3, the same concept. So that's the general equation for the volume of a prismatic shape. The area of bottom, like this rectangular shape, L1 times L3, L3 uh, plus the area of the other end, L2 times L4, divided by two, basically this gives me like the average area of the rectangular shape and I multiplied by the depth. And basically in the final equation, I'm replacing uh, the known parameters with the equivalent values. So this way I end up with having L3 as my unknown and H1. And again, for H1, the depth, uh, you can use 1.5. So this equation has only L3 unknown, assuming uh, you ended up finding the water quality capture volume from the city of San Diego guidelines uh, with the equation that I presented in the previous slide. So you can solve for L3 here. And then after uh, you do that, uh, it is easy for us to come up with the storage curve. The storage curve is a figure that we have for every single reservoir or a basin, uh, we basically want to know at each depth how much storage we have. And again, uh, for those of you who have experience with my civil 3D macro station, you can do it for any shapes in the world. Uh, no need to limit yourself to uh, prismatic shapes. But for this uh, lecture, we focus on prismatic shape because uh, knowing that like for this shape, for example, I know that, that at H zero, like at the bottom depth, I, my area and my volume is basically zero. And at H equals to 1.5, uh, 
uh, that's my area. So every equation is explicit and I can solve it by hand. So now I want to show you how to add a storage unit to swim to model this part and import the appropriate parameters. Uh, following the uh, appendix B1 uh, that I showed you uh, for the specific area that I'm showing in this lecture, uh, my DCV, which is also known as the water, uh, water quality CV, is equal to 24,000 cubic feet. And um, again, that is coming from uh, the equation in B1, uh, finding the depth for the 85th percentile precipitation times it by the runoff factor C and times it by the area of the watershed. Very simple. And now I want to put 24,000, if I go to the previous slide right here, 24,000 goes here, H1, I have 1.5, so I can solve for L3. And for that, I personally use my uh, Texas calculator, TI calculator with the numer numerical solver. The, the, every calculator that is appropriate for engineering for more than 10, just 10 bucks has a numerical solver. But if you don't have that, you can use the, your computer like the Excel gold seek to solve for L3. And then in my case, that gives me 86 feet. So you can use that to also, if you're first time using a numerical solver, you can see uh, how to do it and then uh, check your calculations with my numbers here. So after that, finding L1, L2, and L4 is very easy. Uh, if I go back, L1, L2, and L4, you can solve them explicitly. No need for a numerical solver. And uh, now that, that's the storage curve part, which I told you it's very easy to deal with prismatic shapes. I put zero, for example, uh, in this type of uh, curve that is appropriate for stream, I need to know at each depth, at each depth, uh, what's the surface area for the water. At depth zero, that's the smaller rectangle, which is L1 times L3. And at H1.5, it's the larger rectangle. And these are my numbers, 14,000 and 18,000. So if I go back here, again, at the bottom depth, that is uh, my surface area. And at 1.5, that's my larger surface area, L times, L2 times L4. And just to remind you what shape I'm dealing with is this shape. I have a shape that is prismatic. This is the minor volume that I'm solving right now. And it's prismatic, as you can see, all side walls have a slope of four to one. And uh, the, the focus is to come up with the right dimensions so I can fit the water quality capture volume in my minor storage. So I'm going forward. So another part to consider that the maximum depth um, in, in the outfall that you're designing this uh, detention basin for, uh, you just need to consider an elevation that is six feet uh, lower than your outfall elevation for the invert of the basin. And um, the maximum depth for that storage is 1.5. Um, now I go to swim to show you how to do all these. So that's the model that I'm presenting and working for today. Uh, this is a new development. This entire area is currently undeveloped. Uh, that's the situation that we use for pre-development, meaning uh, a very low uh, imperviousness and no conduit, 
but my model, I'm modeling what happens if I do land development. I'm going to do land development and then build all these uh, sub catchments and urbanized housing and uh, commercial land uses and areas, as you can see, like three acres. I have this in this one. I have uh, six acres in this one and I have a series of conduits. Um, I, like I have a culvert, circular shape, then trapezoidal channel for a swale, then it goes uh, to the another trapezoidal, goes to the circular conduit and trapezoidal. So you can see with a series of conduits, I'm draining uh, my uh, basically proposed plan, which is a hypothetical scenario at this time, uh, how to drain uh, the urbanized areas. And of course, I am increasing the amount of um, stormwater volume and peak flow rate at the outlet. So the whole purpose of putting a detention basin right here is that uh, after I do land development, I do not cause flooding issues for people living in downstream. And also I do not uh, create public health issues because of draining too much debris, suspended solid and all pollutants uh, just delivering and capturing into downstream areas. So very basically, uh, we want to be responsible of the mess that we're creating. We do land development, we make profit out of it, the regulations for standards for stormwater standards uh, they require us to mimic the pre-development situation and um, basically replicate that by putting stormwater mitigation scenarios the most popular one being a detention basin so for this purpose i am going to add a storage unit that's the storage node i'm going to just add it for a place like this. And then I can make the um, data entry that I explained. So I can call it, um, you know, the name could be extended detention basin and uh, no inflows, no treatment, but you can have an inbuilt elevation that is six feet lower than that. So what is my invert elevation uh, 4962 so i need to have 4956 at the basin put it 4956 maximum depth is uh, i am just putting the, the the storage for the wqcv at this time so 1.5 is what i'm considering for the initial depth this parameter uh, we use 1.5, assuming that the uh, WQCV basin is full of water. And the reason for that is that that's uh, what we do only for sizing the hydraulic connectors like orifice. Uh, if I run this as a full basin and in independent of my actual model, that's a lot easier for uh, sizing of the connectors like orifices. And after we do all the sizing, then I connect the whole watershed to the basin and see how it performs. Uh, but now, because I know how much uh, volume I need for WQCV, which is a hypothetical value, I don't have it actually in my rainfall record or anything, it's best that I run uh, the sizing part of orifices independent. So I don't link this to my model yet. I consider and assume that 1.5, meaning the WQCV basin is full of water. And then I find the best dimensions for my orifice that can uh, fully drain this in my desired time, which is 40 hours in this example. And I'll show you in a few minutes. So we consider 1.5 for the initial depth. And uh, other parameters are optional. We don't really need it, uh, evaporation and seepage for sizing a detention basin. And uh, for something very important, the storage curve, 
we basically need to know at each depth what's the surface area of water stored in the basin. So there are two methods for that. A functional curve, you can use an exponential curve that's best for um, basins with irregular shapes, natural basins. But for uh, prismatic shapes, it is best that we work with a tabular curve and we uh, input the numbers for the known depths. Uh, so here I have two options, tabular, functional, I select tabular. And in the tabular, I need to link it to an existing curve. And the curves are right here. So under the storage curve, I uh, added this for my minor basin, which is responsible for both WQCV and two-year event. And here uh, I have numbers as at uh, depth zero, uh, I have 14,700 and then at the full depth 1.5, I have 18,000, which I showed you in the slide. Uh, basically, if I go one slide back, you'll see in this prismatic shape, um, that's the bottom rectangle uh, with the area of L3 times L1, this smaller one. And at 1.5 depth, uh, 1.5 feet depth, I have L2 times L4, which is the bigger uh, rectangle. So here in swim, if I view this, then I see this is my uh, surface area at the bottom is uh, corresponding to 14,700. And this length is the surface area at 1.5 feet, meaning that uh, the cross section of the prism is growing as the uh, H increases. So that's how to import numbers. Basically, this is a very regular shape. I only need two depth area uh, data points. If it's irregular, you might need hundreds and hundreds. Um, that's something that can be exported from uh, geometric software such as AutoCAD Civil 3D and MicroStation. So that is good for the minor um, basin I have. And in the basin, I just need to uh, select the right curve. And that's the one I'm doing. I'm using the curve information for my minor and now it is linked. So now I can save and close this and continue the steps explaining the presentation. Uh, so we now have a curve uh, at each depth. I know what's my surface area. And then six feet in invert elevation difference, I did that. And uh, maximum depth of 1.5 for the WQCV basin. Now, as I explained, I considered 1.5 feet for the initial condition of the basin, considering a full basin. So I can uh, just run this independent to my actual uh, precipitation information in the watershed, which makes it a lot easier. Otherwise I have to manipulate my precipitation data, which takes a lot of time. And now I need to add appropriate hydraulic connectors. I need a node, so with that node, uh, which is located two feet below the storage to avoid backwater condition, um, I can link my orifice to this node as the outflow of the basin. And a conduit and outfall happens after that. So let me show you how to do that. Back to swim. Here, I add a node. So maybe it's a good time that we pay a closer, we take a closer look at the shortcuts that we have here. That's for rain gauge, we have one here. That's for sub catchments. We have uh, six of them, seven of them in this figure. That's for the node. I need this one to put it right here. Uh, but we have links like outlets, sorry, outfall node that I have an outfall. And basically I'm going to uh, replace it with one that goes through the basin first. And the storage uh, node uh, we just used right now, conduit, pump, which is not appropriate for this example, but these are helpful. Orifice, 
I need an orifice. And with this orifice, I can link my basin to the node. And that is the orifice I'm using for the WQCV. So I can call this orifice number one, or maybe just O1 is fine because in the figure I showed you earlier, I have O1, O2, O3, and a weir. So I use this and I add other information after um, putting the right info um, in this one. So let me just close this and save. So first thing first, uh, I have this storage unit. I need to uh, be sure that my node downstream of it is at least two feet lower than that. So I don't have a backwater condition. So opening this, I have 49.56 in the invert. So I put 49.54 for the node. Invert 49.54. And that is all I need. Uh, 49.54. The other information are optional if you want to mm, have a, a situation like a maximum depth for flooding and stuff, which is appropriate for manhole, but not for this one. So we just make sure we have the right uh invert elevation information and now i can edit my orifice for orifice um going back to my slide uh, a typical shape is rectangular shape we could use some circular but rectangular is easier for like concrete risers and stuff and it's located on the side wall uh, with no offset so it, it the, the bottom of the orifice just touches the bottom of the basin basically. So let's do that. We change the, we keep it aside. We don't do bottom really because that uh, traps a lot of debris and trash. So clogging happens. And for this, we make it rectangular closed. And the whole goal of this exercise at this point is to find the right sizes. The, the sizes that allow the water stored in the WQCV basin uh, released in 40 hours, roughly. Uh, of course, one foot and one foot is the default values and that's not something that makes sense. We change them and I'll show you how. But for now, we need to uh, make sure that other information are correct. In inlet offset zero is fine, meaning that the bottom of the uh, side orifice touches the bottom of the basin. And uh, we can leave the default value of the discharge coefficient. That's the C factor in the uh, orifice equation and no flap gate. That's not really the case for uh, orifices. So we just leave it as no. And uh, just to remind you what's a discharge coefficient for orifice equation, that is uh, the general equation of orifices and the, the C factor area and the gravitational uh, acceleration and the head of water, basically. Uh, we don't really uh, solve this equation here, but we need to know what is uh, C factor, just a reminder for you guys. And uh, after doing this, we basically need to know that our model has fine and appropriate temporal resolution for drainage design, which is a very uh, ten, uh, fine resolution we need to use, like 10 or 15 seconds uh, for wet weather. And of course, the dry weather is not even applicable because we are focusing on design storm, which is just a single wet event. So going back here, I'm good with what I need for this one. So I can save. And I have the right information for the junction. And I'll take a look at my options here. So for the options, time steps, uh, reporting step one minute, 
one minute and one hour uh, for driver and one minute for wet weather. Basically, uh, we need to make everything as 15 seconds. So zero, zero, 15. Routing is 15, fine. Drive there one hour, that's not even important because we don't have a drive there situation, but we do have uh, wet weather. So I change this to 15 seconds so I can show the system response over time uh, at the course of a design storm, which is just the event for a short period of time. Um, so I okay this and save. And I need to make sure that I have the other elements I described here. After orifice, uh, then the water is collected. Then there is a conduit or like a pipe thing that take uh, all the water from all orifices and veer and take it to an outfall node. Because we're running this in parallel, I'm going to add a new outfall right here. Uh, so then that's my O2 basically. Uh, I have O1 for the actual outlet. I call this O2, which is basically for the sizing of the system. So O2, enter, save. And then now I need a conduit to collect the water from this junction to the outlet. And conduit is right here at the conduit. Click, double click, and then right click. So for this, Let's call this C conduit of the basin, for example, CB1. Uh, that's a you know, site specific thing. We can have like 100 feet of this pipe. Roughness is fine. Basically, it's your choice how to want to, how you want to drain the water from the basin, but um, a maximum feet of let's say uh, five feet uh, we were using a pipe of that size for collect at you know detention basin eventually the detention basin uh, has to be able to drain a hundred year event so we want to have we want to make sure that we have enough sizing and other information you can leave it as default and save so Continuing our step-by-step uh, -step approach, uh, we have an independent model. It's not even linked to our watershed. Uh, so we can easily size the basin and the uh, orifices, most importantly. And we did the invert elevation for backwater. We added orifice, conduit, and a new outfall node. So for sizing, we inserted the parameters that we had a default value, but not for the height and the width of the orifice. That's something that we actually need to do it iteratively. So we make sure we have the dynamic way routing, which is the most accurate type of routing, as I explained. And of course, for basins and routing of water to basins, we do need to follow this. So here, simply, we just change the orifice dimensions uh, iteratively and run the model and find the sizing that can uh, drain the water in 40 hours from the WQCV basin, from the minor basin. And of course, it might take in the entire time in the world to have it at zero feet. We don't need that. We can assume a threshold of uh, 0 0.05 feet is essentially a situation that the basin is empty. Uh, you might need like another 100 hours to get to something that is like 0 0.000 feet. We don't need that. We never do uh, absolute values for computer modeling. And we just need to make sure that our simulation span is long enough. So if you're draining a 40 hours uh, sim uh, situation, then at least run your model for 80 hours. That's a rule of thumb thing. So make sure we have the right... Uh, routing approach that is for in general after selecting options then it's activated here general and i have kinematic wave i need to switch it to dynamic wave and then you can leave the default numbers in uh, dynamic wave that's fine 
and not to be the scope of this exercise. So okay this and save. And make sure you have enough temporal span to uh, run this. So you have at least 80 hours if you're solving for 40 hours round down time. So this starts at January 1st, 2007, but you can see I have only, um, you know, on the same date, it ends at 12. So meaning it, it has 12 hours. Basically, I need to have 80 hours, uh, which is three days. And then I go two, three, January 3rd, 12, at 12, that gives me 80 hours uh, for sure. So I can do this. So I OK. And I save again. And uh, I can run the model at this stage. And basically, I just click Run. So for the storage, I click and see what's going on in my storage. So depth is one factor you can show. You can show volume, or you can, uh, like if I want to, if you want to follow the approach of uh, having a threshold of 0 0.05 feet, then depth is the one that you can keep. But if you want to do it in the volume approach, that's also fine. So just do an accept and okay. So it this is giving you a figure. Like this is giving you, if you keep uh, and the orifice that I just used uh, for default information, then of course you start from 1.5 feet, but you are not in a situation that um at, at 40 hours your uh, basin is empty you can see the situation of having empty happens uh sooner than that so that 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 means that you need to change the sizing and then redo this or if you want to see the exact uh depth at each time instead of creating a figure you can create a table creating a table and just do it by the object which is your uh, node, elapsed time, you can OK this. So you can see, you can go and find uh, the situation that you have 0 0.05. 0 0.05, it's happening at the depth of, at the time of, here, the first time that's happening, eight hours, I have, uh, too many time steps, so that's why it's taking. But at, at eight hours, I am uh, having a basin that is essentially empty. So this has to be four hours. That means I need to do another iteration. And for that, uh, I have my results right here. Uh, basically, this is the last time I, I, I ran this model, and I check different things of course having one feet for the width of the uh orifice is too large uh 0.25 is where you start so uh in a scenario of 0.25 for width then this for height then that's 53 58 which is still not 40. then i had another iteration i make this bigger so quarter of feet for both, which is square shape, then it's giving me 43 hours. So I'm getting close. And then I'm also showing the results also here. So that's the one that taking 53 hours, I am not on the uh, side that I want to be. Uh, it's, you know, I need to touch the, the, the bottom of the curve and, and figure at, at the 40 hours. So I'm over than that. Then iteration two is helping somewhat. And then I have iteration three, which is now making it too large. And then it's happening, the purple color, it's happening at 27 hours. 
And finally, the green shape, uh, as you can see, that's touching the threshold about the 40 hours, 40 hours and 12 minutes for a shape that has 0.3 height and 0.25 for width. Point three four height and point two five four width. So that's what I need to have. Okay, now that we're done with the WQCV stuff in terms of the volume and the right size for the orifice, now we want to get to work with our actual design storm, the ones that we run through this rain gauge and uh, like the 100 year, two year, 10 year, and it precipitates over the watershed and it's generated, uh, it's generating a peak flow at the outfall. So then that makes sense to link our watershed to our actual detention basin so we can uh, size for that, not for the hypothetical uh, 85th percentile uh, generating a specific depth at our basin. And for that purpose, um, we just follow uh, the step-by-step -step presentation. Um, after running uh, our pre-development and post-development scenarios, this is the table that I have for my example area. Basically, it's very simple. We are responsible to take care of the mess that we're creating for people living in our downstream. So our land development projects uh, creating a 33 CFS of peak flow under a two-year condition, I need to match it to four CFS, which is the pre-development existing. And if everybody does the same thing, then we avoid flooding and of course the pollution distribution in the watershed. Uh, so first step, just connect our watershed to our basin. Uh, then I can just replace the downstream end of this conduit to what I have for my basin. My basin is called EDB, that's under the name. So I come back to the conduit and then as the outlook node put EDB. And then now it is linked, as you can see, to the basin. So now I can get rid of this. I don't need it. That's the delete sign. Yes. So good time to save. Then now that, that we did this, we can continue um, doing stuff for the um, model. One thing, uh, just to be sure that we have the right invert elevation for the outfall because we uh, changed it. So I had this plus six. So 49.62 is the actual outlet elevation for the outlet two. Plus two. Forty-nine, sixty-two, and everything else stays the same. And then for the conduit, I am considering a hundred feet uh, pipe of uh, uh, a circular shape of five feet is uh, ultimately draining all the orifices and uh, rear of the basin. So that is for that. So we know that uh, what we're dealing here with is a lot larger than uh, the WQCV. Like in my example, uh, you saw that I have about half an inch of rainfall for WQCV. But a two-year storm is, of course, larger than that. This means that we need to uh, add more capacity to our ongoing basin. So we started with 
uh, 1.5 as the depth to uh, size the orifice of the WQCV. Now we need to show what's happening above that capacity. Uh, six feet is what we eventually get with. So just temporarily uh, add uh, a depth of six feet and see um, what area that means. So again, we're dealing with a shape that is very easy to do the calculations for uh, finding the surface area at each depth. At the depth of six feet, I'm getting about 29,583 uh, square feet. And basically uh, it's simple. Like, let me go back here, I'm showing Uh, yeah, that's area, H0. I'm showing at each increment of 1.5 feet, I am getting this difference, right? That is 3,300 um, of, of surface area. So then I just need to do this increment one more time. At H3, I have twice that, H4.5 three times, and H uh, for uh, HH equals to six feet, then I have four times of that increment of 3,300 feet added to uh, my starting point. So then that places me at um, 29,000 square feet. And here we do not uh, need to consider any initial water in the storage unit. So let me make all these changes. Basically for the storage unit, reading from this curve. I need a new data point at six. Then I have 29,583. So if I view this, then it means that I did the right thing. Uh, it's just linearly increasing the storage uh, in a prismatic shape. So I just did that as a starting point. Uh, six feet gonna be my like ultimate depth. Pro probably I don't need this much of volume, but let's see uh, what depth I get after running the model so I can refine this. So I OK this, so I don't lose data, and I save. Then I did this change. Initial depth being 0, let's make sure we, we did that, because for the last run, we had 1.5. So yes, so we need to change the maximum depth to 6, and initial depth to 0. So this way, it makes sense, because we, we're assigning a curve that has all, all the way to six feet. And again, we don't need to put any initial water. The water is calculated, uh, draining from the entire watershed, routed to the um, basin. So I save. And then, uh, let's just run it with the two-year storm and see how much maximum date, uh, depth I get in this storage. What's the peak discharge after going through the orifice? And then how much time it takes to drain the basin? So in this case, I need to make sure that I have a two-year event, not 100-year, because I'm designing for that. I save and I run. Run successfully. OK it. Then see what's going on here. I select it and then Plot some. That's for the CFS about 0.4 ish, 0.5. Uh, about 0.5 is fine. If you remember, here I have uh, pre development of 4.1. So uh, now I'm getting to. 0.5 for the mitigated condition if I add another column here. Uh, so I'm way below that. That's that's uh, a good sign.
And to show you what other results I got quickly from running, uh, that's the CFS discharge, the exact number. The maximum storage unit is uh, 2.8, meaning that although I consider six feet, but that was not really used and a drawn down time of 56 minutes. So just to provide more discussions, again, 0.6 CFS is great in terms of being lower than the pre-dev conditions. We can be happy about it, but that just means that we have an over-design if we're too below it. It is creating a basin that is too large and definitely too costly. So your client would not allow you to design like this. It's like uh, somewhere around four ish CFS you have to be. Uh, above that, then you're not mitigating and complying with regulations, but just capturing every stormwater ever uh, is not necessary and it's not really uh, needed uh, to spend that much of money for a detention basin. So basically means that we just need to increase the discharge. Increasing the discharge also helps us to reduce the drawn on time. So we need uh, to add another orifice, basically, another side orifice, rectangular shape, and we want to just place it above the uh, WQCV storage. So we considered 1.5, uh, of depth for that storage. So just above that, we must consider an inlet offset of 1.5. Just above that storage, we had add another orifice. So let me uh, show that, how to, um, how we can do so. So in swim, I have one orifice, then my orifice number two, I start from here then I just do this additional vertex to be able to show this so they don't uh, stay over top of each other and we, we just um, cannot identify which is which. And double click here and close. So then that's my orifice number two. Let's put O. Let's make sure it is side. It is, um, sorry, I need to O2 and enter. Um, O2 and rectangular closed. So of course you can assume how to come up with height and width, right? It's another round of iterations. And for that, um, we can leave this as is, or we can uh, but before we forget, we need to put 1.5 for the uh, offset. So then the bottom of this orifice is just uh, touching the line of the uh, um, upper end of the storage for WQCV. And we can use the default value for the um, drainage coefficient factor C. So we save, we run, it runs perfectly. So we can uh, play around with this basically to see what's happening inside uh, the storage. And I have these results. So you know how to get those results from your model and orifice that has a size of a half a feet height and two feet width is working in my case. And then I'm saying working because it's getting somewhere around 4.1 CFS. So that is definitely acceptable. I'm below the, the limit and I'm not too below. And it also gives me a storage depth of 2.2 feet. So everything beyond that is not used. So basically it means at this stage, I have a shape of this. So that's the bottom orifice for WQCV. It's a tiny one. And if you remember, we uh, solved iteratively 0.3 feet for height, 0.25 for width. Now 
I have half a foot for height and I have uh, um, two feet for width. Basically, uh, my my um, storage, my, my lower storage, it's solved at this point. I only need 2.2 feet for the height. As you can see in the previous slide right here, I started with six feet, but that was not used. So I can cut it right here. So I'm saving money for excavation materials if uh, any compaction is needed. That is a big saving. Uh, we, we keep it at 2.2 uh, feet instead of going all the way to six feet. So that top of storage will be the subject of our major um, uh, storage calculations. 